Hi everybody, I'm Greg Fischel and welcome to bonus weather video number one for this week. And today we're going to talk about the National Weather Service Doppler radars and uh, some of the uh, characteristics of the radar and then some of the limitations. And it has nothing to do with the fact that it's a National Weather Service radar. They're the best radars out there. Uh, but there are certain limitations of our physical world which are uh, affect everything. And radar is no exception to that. So let's go on ahead now and take a look at a couple of interesting tidbits, if you will, uh, concerning uh, radar. Uh, a couple of modes that the radar can be put into, one is called a clear air mode, and this is a hypersensitive mode where you only use this if there's not precipitation around or if the precipitation is very, very light and perhaps in a frozen form. Uh, turns out that snow, for instance, is not a very good reflector uh, of the electromagnetic radiation that the radar is sending out, and so you have to put it into a hypersensitive mode, especially with light snow, to be able to see it. There are other features you can look for, though, like, for instance, along the coast in the summertime, you get something called a sea breeze front, which works its way inland, but there's no precipitation associated with it necessarily. So uh, since the air converges along that sea breeze front, you can get birds and insects and dust that also converge right along that boundary. And so we use those as targets. And basically it can tell us where the sea breeze is located, which might be useful for potential thunderstorm development down the road. Sometimes it hasn't happened yet, but it will eventually. And so we're able to see where that feature is by using this clear air mode. Now, another interesting thing here is I want you to notice uh, there are different elevation angles here. And a half a degree would mean a half a degree above horizontal, one and a half degrees is one and a half degrees above horizontal and so forth. But notice how the bottom of this uh, curved area, or this half a degree elevation, actually curves as it goes out from the radar. That's because the Earth is curved, and as the radar beam goes out, the Earth is curving away from it, and so it's getting higher above the ground. So by the time you get to 120 miles out, the radar beam is 10,000 feet above the ground, which means the people in Wilmington would never want to rely on the Raleigh radar to see something over them because it's looking at the atmosphere 10,000 feet above the ground. That's why the radars are spaced the way they are so that this minimizes that issue. The other thing is, do you notice how that band widens as it goes out? That's because the radar beam widens as it goes out, and so it can't resolve the detail at a distance that it can close in. Think of having a really, really nasty resolution camera in the old days, and you're looking across a lake taking a picture of four houses. Well, that camera may see those four houses as one house, okay, which is really bad. But a higher resolution camera will see all four houses exactly the way they are. And so basically, radar is really good close in, and then as you head out, it begins to lose its effectiveness over time. Okay, let's go on ahead now and take a look at another mode that the radar can be in, and that's called the precipitation mode. And here you have a whole bunch of different elevation angles, all the way from half a degree up to 19.5 degrees. And you may wonder, well, why would you want to go all the way up to 19.5 degrees? because we want to take a look, or the radar operator wants to take a look at the vertical structure of the precipitation that's falling. In a thunderstorm, for instance, a really strong thunderstorm will have an updraft that is so strong it actually suspends the precipitation aloft. And so by being able to scan the entire thunderstorm, we can see where those areas of precipitation that are being suspended aloft are. That tells us the updraft is strong. That tells us the thunderstorm is potentially severe. And that's just one of many, many examples as to why it's important to look at the whole thing. However, there are some limitations with that as well. Here's a picture of what the full scan may look like. Do you notice that gaping hole right in the middle there? That is called the cone of silence. Basically, everything in that cone, the radar can't see. So if you're looking for something directly overhead of the radar, or not too far away, but at a decent elevation, you ain't going to see it, OK? And the tornado that hit back in 1988, the big Raleigh tornado uh, Thanksgiving weekend of 1988, that radar formed very, very close to the radar itself. And so it was more than likely in the cone of silence uh, back at that time, although uh, we didn't have Doppler radars in Raleigh back at that time. 
Uh, but even if we had, that may have been an issue. Also notice that brown area, that cone of silence, also exists near the ground. It gets higher as you go out. That's the problem I talked about earlier, where basically the radar beam is going out, but the Earth is curving away from it, and so it can't see things underneath that elevation. And so there are limitations to radar, but overall it is the best tool we have for filling in the gaps between the observation points. Like, you know, we have observations at all the airports like, you know, Raleigh-Durham and Smithfield and Chapel Hill and Roanoke Rapids, but people live in between those airports and we don't have human beings in those places telling us what's going on. So radar is a great way uh, to basically fill in those gaps and it does a wonderful, wonderful job. Okay, that's it for today. Hope you found that interesting. I hope you are beaming with excitement. And we'll be back with another bonus weather video coming up on Friday. We'll see you then.